Good morning, everybody. Today we will continue with the applications of Gauss law. At the beginning of chapter 22, I have told you that we will mainly deal with this formula. This is the electric flux, and on the right side we have a closed surface integral. This is the electric field, this is the, the A area, and on the right side we have total charge enclosed by surface, and here we have epsilon zero, electric constant. We have learned this formula during the last lecture. And today we will apply this formula to the different symmetric shapes. First of all, just consider that we have a conductor. Just consider that here we have a metal piece, okay? And then we cut this metal piece into two parts. And now I am looking at this cross section of the metal. On the right side, I have cross section of the metal. And just consider that this metal is positively charged. And in conductors, there is no charge within the material. Okay? The net charge inside the surface is zero. In a conductor, all charges are located on the surface of the metal, okay? And then there is no charge inside the surface. For this reason, for example, if someone asks you that, what is the electric field here? So this is the question, let's consider. By using the Gauss law, you can easily calculate it. What about the charge Q enclosed within this closed surface. Within this Gaussian surface here, inside conductor, the total charge is zero because there is no charge within the conductor, okay? And since Q enclosed is zero, then electric field in this area, in this Gaussian surface is also zero, okay? Electric field within the conductor is zero in this selected surface. You can also understand this behavior by using this explanation. This is just to explain in a better way, okay? And I hope it will help you. I have a metal and you put positive charges on a metal Okay, and we will have nothing inside the conductor. Actually, we have material inside of the conductor, but there is no charge inside the surface. Why? Because if you put here positive charge, if you put here positive charge, since they are positively charged particles or since they are same charges, they will repel each other and this charge will move in this direction, this charge will move in this direction, okay? And if you have any other positive charges, they will move in this direction to the surface, from center to the surface. So at the beginning, there will be nothing in the center of the conductor, okay? So you can consider like this, this is just representation for simplicity. Or just charge the conductor with negative charges, okay, put negative charges, and just consider that you can also put negative charges here, but these negative charges will be repelled by negative charges and they will move to the surface of the conductor, okay? So for this reason, within the conductor, there is no net charge, okay? Inside the conductor, there is no charge. Don't forget this one. All charges in the conductors are placed on the surface of the conductor and nothing inside the surface. I hope this part is clear. We will use this information for the forthcoming examples. Do you have any question here? If something is not clear, please let me know. Okay. Now let me continue with the field of a charge conducting sphere. We have a charge conducting sphere 
and we will calculate electric field at the surface of the sphere, far from the surface of the sphere and inside the sphere. So for three different positions, we will calculate the electric field. Actually, we have done such calculations in the previous chapter, chapter 21, when we are dealing with the Clomp's law, okay? You can also calculate the electric field by using this formula, by using the Clomp's law for pi epsilon zero q over r square. Okay, we have used this Clomp's law during the last lecture to calculate the electric fields far from the objects or on the surface of the objects. And here for the same spherical conducting material or cylindrical conducting material or metal sheet, we will calculate the electric field, but we will use the Gauss law instead of Clomp's law. And then you will see that how Gauss law is useful and easy compared to the Clomp's law to calculate the electric fields. OK, we will do the same. So now look at the question. We place a total positive charge Q on a solid conducting sphere with radius R find electric field at any point inside or outside the sphere. Here we have a metal sphere. This is solid. Solid means that the metal sphere is filled with metal, okay? There is no empty place. Sometimes you will see hollow sphere. In hollow sphere, there will be cavity within the sphere, okay? But now we are dealing with the solid sphere. Okay, let's continue. So we have to find the electric field at any point inside or outside sphere. How to calculate this one? So just use this formula. Da Q enclosed, this is the Gauss law, over epsilon zero. This gives also us the electric flux, right? So what about the area of the sphere if the radius is r here we have the a area is 4 pi r square if i am talking about this r radius okay on the surface of the sphere then i know the area what about the q enclosed q enclosed is given in the question it is positive q charge OK, I also know the Q. Then epsilon zero is constant, electric constant. Then by using this formula, I can calculate the electric field. Then electric field 4 pi R square is equal to Q over epsilon zero. Then if I take the electric field from this expression, I can calculate this one. If the radius of the sphere is R, or I am dealing with the electric field on the surface of the sphere, okay? Now we have calculated electric field on the surface of the sphere. Now, just choose a bigger Gaussian surface with bigger radius. Now just consider that radius is 2R. OK, and then just choose another bigger Gaussian surface with 3R. OK, so what about the electric field for this Gaussian surfaces? Look at this first case. What about the total charge within this closed surface? The total charge does not change Q. OK, what about the radius of this bigger surface? The radius of the bigger surface is given with this 2r radius, okay, 4 pi 2r square. Then you can calculate area and then you can calculate the electric field. And for the bigger surface, you can do that. You can do the same. So then you will get this type of relation. We will have a general formula for the electric field outside the sphere, okay? 
and here we have radius of the sphere. The total net charge within this sphere is same. It is Q. Then we have electric field. What do you see here? If R increases, then electric field decreases. And I can see it here. This is the electric field axis. And this is the radius axis R. And what I see that the electric field decreases with radius. And this is given with this expression, this formula. Right? I hope this part is clear. But here we have another question. What about the electric field at any point inside the sphere? Inside the sphere. So what about the electric field here at this point? What about the electric field here inside the sphere? In order to calculate the electric field inside the sphere, I need Q enclosed, the total net charge inside the sphere. Since this is a conducting sphere, this is given in the question, sometimes in questions, it is also given that it is a metal sphere, okay? Here it is written conducting sphere, but sometimes it can be written metal sphere, so it is also a conductor, okay? So then within the metals, within the conductors, there is no charge inside the sphere, so the Q enclosed within the sphere is zero, then electric field within the sphere, inside the sphere, will be zero, okay? Then again, look at the graph here. Here we have R, this is just on the surface of the sphere. We have this electric field. This is the magnitude of the electric field on the surface of the sphere. And far from the sphere, electric field decreases, okay? Also in this direction, in this direction, if you're far from the sphere, electric field decreases. But what about in this region, inside the sphere? In this region, electric field is zero, okay? Don't forget this one. Do you have any question here? If you don't understand something, please let me know. Here, there is a caution during the last semester, I have told you that there are many cautions in the book, in each chapter, okay? And these cautions are very important to understand the topic. So here, caution is about flex can be positive or negative. We have already seen this one during the last lecture. So if you have a positively charged metal sphere or conducting sphere, we will have electric field lines outward, right? And then electric flux will be outward, right? This is the positive electric flux. And if you have negatively charged conducting sphere, again, all charges are located on the surface of the sphere, and now we will have negative flux, okay? Don't forget this one. But what about the magnitude of the flux? If we have same Q charge for this positively charged sphere and also for this negatively charged sphere, if we have same magnitude of Q charge, then we will have same magnitude of electric field, but only the direction of the electric flux will be positive or negative depending on the charge sign. I hope this part is also clear. Then, let me continue with the field of a uniform line charge. Just consider that we have a metal rod, okay, from copper, from iron, for example. It is long, thin wire, okay, infinitely long, very long 
thin metal wire. And then just consider that this metal wire is positively charged. And what about the electric field of this long thin wire? How to calculate electric field due to this infinitely long thin wire? Just consider that the charge per unit length is lambda and it is assumed to be positive. You remember lambda, sigma, and rho from the first lecture. This is linear charge density. This is surface charge density. This is volume charge density. Okay, what is the meaning of this? Lambda is given with Q over L and sigma is given with Q over area and rho is given with Q over volume, okay? Linear charge density, surface charge density, and volume charge density. These terms are very important for more or less many chapters of physics too, okay? Please always keep this information in your mind. And look at this one. Let me choose another pen here. In many questions, you will have such definitions. For example, you would like to calculate the Q charge of this infinitely long thin metal wire. Then you can write it like this, lambda times L, okay? For example, you have a metal sheet and it is also, let's say, positively charged and it has surface charge density sigma. What about the charge of total charge of this metal sheet? The total charge of metal sheet is given with sigma times area, area of this surface. So you can get this one from this relation. And if you have a metal sphere, for example, and then volume charge density is given, but Q is not given, then you can calculate Q with this expression, rho times volume, okay? So this three explanation, three terms are important. So after repeating this information, let me continue. The question is, what is the electric field of this positively charged long thin wire? In order to calculate electric field, I can use again Gauss law, Q enclosed over epsilon zero. I need a surface. I produce a surface here around this thin wire. This is the long thin wire. Okay, positively charged. And I draw an imaginary Gaussian surface. Okay, this is an imaginary Gaussian surface around this thin metal wire. Okay, and here on this Gaussian surface, I choose a dA area and we have electric field perpendicular to this dA area, okay? And what about the electric field on this side of this cylindrical shape? Electric field is zero here because there is no electric field lines along this direction, okay? We have electric field like this. So from positive charge from center to the outward direction, okay? And we don't have any electric field lines in this direction, okay? For this reason, the electric field on this surface is zero. So we have only electric field on the this surface of cylindrical shape. Now let me continue to the question. This is just summary overview of this field of a uniform line charge. 
and then just read the question and then solve the electric field, find the electric field. Electric charge is distributed uniformly along an infinitely long thin wire. The charge per unit length is lambda assumed positive. Find the electric field by using Gauss law. So you will use this expression. This is the Gauss law Q enclosed over epsilon zero. What about the Q enclosed? You can write Q enclosed like this. I have already discussed in the previous transparency, lambda times length of the wire. This is L here, length of the wire. And lambda is linear charge density. It is given in the question, okay? Then here, instead of Q over epsilon zero, now we have lambda L over epsilon zero. And here we have area of this surface. You know how to calculate the areas of the cylindrical shapes, okay? Area of this surface is given with 2 pi r times L. L is this one. 2 pi r is the radius of this one. Then you can calculate area of this blue region of the cylindrical shape. Then this is the area. Just take this area, put this one here. Here I have E. Then I can calculate electric field like this. Okay. If lambda is negative, E is directed radially inward. So now we have positive charges. Okay. And if we volt negative charges, then this electric field here will be inward. Okay, don't forget this one. Do you have any question here? Okay, now let me continue with the another example. Electric field of an infinite plane sheet of charge. Don't look at this figure, okay? Forget this one. We have an infinite plane sheet of charge. And then, it is positively charged. Let's consider we have positive charges on the surface of the sheet. If you look from other side, here we have same positive charges, other side of the sheet, okay? So then the question is that, what about the electric field due to these positive charges? During the last week, we have learned that if you have a positive charge, then we will have electric field lines outward, right? Here, I have many positive charges and electric field lines will be like this, perpendicular to the surface, okay? And I have also positive charges on the other side of the metal sheet, okay? Due to these positive charges, I will also have electric field lines from surface to this direction, okay? So more or less the same mechanism. So we have field lines from the positive charge to the outward direction in both sides. Then how to calculate this electric field? In order to calculate this electric field, again, I need a Gaussian surface. I need an imaginary surface, imaginary closed surface, okay? In order to solve this question, again, I produce a Gaussian surface. Here, in this side, just consider this is the area one, and on the other side, I have area two, okay? Here, I produce a Gaussian surface, an imaginary surface, Okay, cylindrical shape. And on the other side, again, I produce a Gaussian surface, an imaginary cylindrical surface. Okay, and I am dealing with this area because we have electric field lines passing through this area. What about the electric field lines in this regions? 
here we don't have electric field. Electric field in this side is zero. Okay, because the direction of the electric field lines are like this. Also same for this one on the right side. On this side we have zero electric field, but along this direction we have electric field lines. So then how to calculate the electric field of this positively charged metal sheet. Then we can do this one. So again, you use this formula. Da Q enclosed over epsilon zero. First of all, just calculate the Q enclosed. Q enclosed is given with sigma times area. Okay, what was sigma? Sigma was surface charge density. It is given in the question here, surface charge density sigma, a uniform positive surface charge density. Okay, then by using this formula, Q enclosed is sigma times area. And you can calculate Q enclosed. And what about the electric field? Within this closed surface, look at this cylinder. I have this area and here I have contribution E times A. And here on the right side, I have another contribution E times A. Then I have two E times A. And what about the total charge? What about the Q enclosed? Q enclosed is given with sigma times A. Then over epsilon zero. And this A cancels this one, then electric field of an infinite sheet of charge is given with sigma over two epsilon zero. Please try to keep this formula in your mind. It will be very useful for some problems. Do we have any question here? So let me continue with the another condition. This is example 22.9, field of a uniformly charged sphere. Now we have something else. Carefully read the question. Positive electric charge Q is distributed uniformly throughout the volume of an insulating sphere with radius R. We have a sphere and it is an insulator. It is not metal, it is not conductor. And look at this sentence. Q is distributed uniformly throughout the volume of an insulating sphere. So this positive charge is distributed uniformly throughout the material. If it would be conductor, the charges will be placed on the surface of the sphere, but since it is insulator and since the charge is uniformly distributed, then I have also charges inside the sphere, okay? So it is completely different from conductor. If we would have conductor and this positive charges would be distributed throughout the surface of the conductor and nothing inside in conductor. But here we have an insulator and we are dealing with this condition now. Okay, what about the question? Find the magnitude of the electric field at a point P, a distance from the center of the sphere. So here you choose a P point and the distance from the center of the sphere is given with R, okay? And what about the electric field here at this P point? Have to calculate this one. Again, we will use this formula. E, D, A, and Q enclosed over epsilon zero. A is easy, okay? It is four pi square. And then you can easily calculate the flux, four pi square times E. But what is E? 
what is E? How to calculate E? In order to calculate E, I need Q enclosed. So I have to use Gauss law. Gauss law is this one. Very useful formula. If I know the area of the sphere, of the cylindrical shape, of the area of any object, okay? And if I know the Q enclosed, then I can calculate the electric field. Or if I know the electric field, if I know the area, I can calculate the total net charge of the material. Okay, so we will use this formula. Now, in order to calculate Q enclosed, I am using this relation. Rho, volume charge density, is given with Q over volume, okay? And then if I take Q from this expression, I can write it like this, Rho times volume, okay? Then look at this one. This is the Rho and this is the volume, then but here we have V enclosed. Actually, here we have small r, small radius and capital R. Be careful with this one. I will explain this part. So what about the total volume of this sphere? The total volume of this sphere is given with 4 pi over 3 r power 3, okay? This is the volume of the sphere. And what about the total charge of the sphere? Total charge is positive Q, and this charged sphere has this volume charge density, okay? So by using this relation, I can calculate this volume charge density, Q over volume of the sphere, 4 pi r power 3 over 3, okay? If I take Q from this expression, then now I'm dealing with the Q enclosed for a smaller sphere, okay? What about the Q here? I have calculated Q for this sphere, but if I choose a smaller sphere within this insulating sphere, what about the total charge within this Gaussian surface? I hope you can understand this part. Then this total charge within this smaller sphere, okay, is given with rho times V enclosed. What is V enclosed? the volume of this small sphere, okay? The volume of this Gaussian surface, okay? And it is given with four pi over three r power three, okay? Now I have small r because this sphere has radius r, okay? I have already given in the picture and also in the question. So then, just put the volume of this small sphere here, this one, and this is the volume charge density of the sphere. Then finally, the total charge within this smaller sphere, the total charge within this smaller sphere is given with this expression. The total charge of the sphere r power 3 over r capital power 3, okay? Then, what about the Gauss law? E times dA and Q enclosed over epsilon 0. I have already calculated Q enclosed, put it there. I need electric field. What about the area of this smaller sphere? area of the smaller sphere is given with 4 pi r square, right? Just use this expression here, area of this smaller sphere, and this is the electric field, and this is the Q enclosed over epsilon zero. Then we can calculate the electric field inside a uniformly charged sphere. And what about the electric field? 
outside of this sphere. Now let me clean this part. In the first part, we have calculated electric field here, electric field here or here, okay, inside the sphere. But what about the electric field here? What about the electric field here outside the sphere? In order to calculate the electric field outside the sphere, again, what we need, electric field in this point, let's say, and then I choose a Gaussian surface like this. It has certain distance from the center of the sphere, which is given with R, and then the area of this one is given with 4 pi r square. Then what about the Q enclosed? Q enclosed within this Gaussian surface is only given with the total charge of this sphere. Then this is the Q over epsilon zero. Then by using this relation, you can calculate electric field in this form. This one. OK, 1 over 4 pi epsilon 0 Q over R square. Look at this formula. This is the Clomb's law. OK. If you very far from the center of the sphere, we have this relation. And what do you see here? If you increase the R, then electric field decreases. OK, and you can see this one within this graph. Let me also discuss this one and finish this question. Here at the surface of the sphere, when the radius is R, electric field is given with this expression. OK. And inside the sphere, electric field decreases. Why? Because charge decreases, okay, with this relation. Electric field decreases to the center. And outside the sphere, we have this type of relation for the electric field, which is given with this expression. So these are important limits for the electric fields inside the sphere, on the surface of the sphere, and outside the sphere. So don't forget that this is for insulating material. If it is a conductor, as we have discussed in the previous examples, the result completely changes, okay? In this region, for example, in conductors, in this region, electric field is zero, okay? But in insulators, you can distribute positive charges also inside the sphere. Then we have electric field inside the sphere in case of insulators. OK, you can do that if you uniformly distribute the charges within the insulating sphere. I hope this part is clear. Do you have any question related to this example? Actually, all these electric field calculations have also been done in the chapter 21 by using the Clomb's law. But what do you see here? We use Gauss law in this chapter and it is much simple compared to the Clomb's law to get the electric field of different shapes. OK, now let me continue with the bio application. This is very nice example in the forthcoming chapters. I will also talk about this one for its other applications and the relation between electricity and our body. So here we will talk about charge distribution inside a nerve cell. You know that in our body, the information is carried by the nerve cells, okay, our nervous system. So how the electricity is carried and how it happens within the nerve cells, you can see this very basic example here. The interior of a human nerve cell contains both positive potassium ions and negatively charged protein molecules. 
just consider like this. Let's consider this is the nerve cell. Potassium ions can flow out of the cell through the cell membrane, but the much larger protein molecules cannot. Just consider that here we have a membrane, a barrier. As much as I remember, it is made from lipid, okay? It is insulator. Within the nerve cell, we have negatively charged protein molecules. They are negatively charged. And outside of the nerve cell, we have positively charged potassium ions. Potassium ions are very small compared to these protein molecules, and then they can flow out and flow in, okay? They can travel through this membrane, okay? This is an insulator, and here we have potassium ions, and here we have protein molecules, negatively charged protein molecules. But what do you see here? If you look from outside, just consider here we have two positive ion and here we have two negative ion and in total the net charge is zero. But we have positive charges outside the nerve cell and negative protein molecules inside the nerve cell. So then the result is that the interior of the cell has a ne net negative charge and the fluid outside the cell has a positive charge that balances this one. So this positive charges balances this negative charges inside the cell. The fluid within the cell is a good conductor. So the protein molecules distribute themselves on the outer surface of the fluid. So within the nerve cell, just consider we have fluid, okay? And within the fluid, we have negatively charged protein molecules and this fluid inside the nerve cell is conductor, okay? Since it is conductor, negative charges are located in this inner side of the membrane, okay? Negative charges are collected here and they are balanced with the positive potassium ions outside of the membrane, okay? So, in the forthcoming chapters, we will go into a little bit detail with this nerve cells, but this is very nice example to show you that the fluid within the nerve cell is conductor and it is surrounded by insulating barrier, insulating membrane, okay? as much as I remember, made from lipid material. And then we have positive ions outside of the nerve cell, outside of this insulating membrane. Do you have any question related to this one? Okay, let's continue with the charges and conductors. Under electrostatic conditions, during the last week, I have explained what is electrostatic conditions. With the electrostatic conditions, we consider that charges are not in motion, they are at rest or nearly at rest, okay? So, under electrostatic conditions, any excess charge on a solid conductor, this is a solid conductor in this picture, any excess charge resides entirely on the conductor surface here. For example, this is total net charge of QC, okay? And all charges located on the surface of the conductor, and there is no charge inside the conductor. For this reason, electric field is zero within the conductor. We have already discussed this one at the beginning of this lecture. So, what about if we have a hollow cavity inside the conductor? Again, this is a solid conductor. It is positively charged. And now we have a cavity, a hollow within the solid conductor. So then what about the electric field within the cavity? What about the electric field here if I choose a, an arbitrary Gaussian surface? So now we will investigate this one. 
here we have QC charge, charge of the conductor, and all these charges are distributed on the surface of the conductor. And inside we have nothing. Within the cavity, we also don't have any charge. And then if I choose an arbitrary Gaussian surface here, then what about the electric field here? EA, let's say. What about the electric field here? So just use this expression again. Q enclosed, epsilon zero. So I need electric field on this Gaussian surface, okay, here. In order to calculate electric field here, I need Q enclosed. What do you see here? Within this surface, there is no charge. Q enclosed here is zero. Then electric field is also zero, even if we have cavity within the conductor, okay? Now let's make the situation a little bit complicated. Just put a positive charge within the cavity. At the beginning, I have a solid conductor and I have a cavity within the conductor and it has charge of QC, okay? And I put a positive charge Q here into the cavity, okay? Then what about the electric field on this Gaussian surface? So now just have a look. Since here I have a positive charge, this positive charge will attract negative charges within the conductor and then repel another positive charges to the surface of the conductor. Okay? This part is very important. It is very easy to understand, but you must stay on the line, okay? So listen carefully. Step by step, I will try to explain. I have positive Q charge here in the center of the cavity, let's say, this is Q charge, and this positive Q collects negative Q here, okay, with the same amount, but opposite sign, and due to this collected negative charges, we have an additional positive Q charge on the surface of the conductor. At the beginning, if we have nothing within the cavity, I have just QC charge on the surface of this conductor. And if I put here a positive charge, it collects negative charges here and repels positive charges here. So then in addition to this QC, I have to add this Q here, and here I will have minus Q here in this inner surface of the conductor, we will have negative charges. I hope this is clear. Then what about the electric field here on this surface? In order to calculate electric field on this surface, I can use the Gauss law again. I choose a closed surface with some certain area. And here we have Q enclosed over epsilon zero. And this is the closed surface, this one. What about the total charge within this closed surface? Q enclosed is, I have positive Q charge in the center in the cavity, and I have negative Q charge collected by this positive charge in the inner surface of the conductor or outer surface of the cavity. In total, within this surface, the net charge is zero, 
then again electric field here is zero. I hope this is clear. If it is not clear, please let me know. OK, then let me continue with one example, conceptual example from the book 22.11, a conductor with a cavity. A conductor with a cavity carries a total charge of positive 7 nanocloomb. We have a conductor and there is a cavity within the conductor and the net charge of the conductor is 7 nanocloomb. And all this positive charge is distributed on the surface of this conductor. OK, and nothing inside. Within the cavity, insulated from the conductor, a point charge of negative 5 nanocloom. So we put here a negative 5 nanocloom. Then how much charge is on each surface, inner and outer of the conductor? This is the question. Let me draw this figure much bigger. I have a conductor and it has net charge positive 7 nanocloomb and there is a cavity and here we have negative 5 nanocloomb and what would be the charge here in the inner surface of the conductor and what would be the net charge on the outer surface of the conductor, OK? So if I have negative 5 nanocloomb in the center, it will attract positive charges within the conductor, and this will be positively charged, and the amount will be positive 5 nanocloomb, OK? In order to balance this change within the conductor, negative 5 nanocloomb will be present in the outer surface of the conductor. OK, so then on the outer surface, I have negative 5 nanocloomb. At the beginning, I have 7 nanocloomb in total. In the outer surface of the conductor, we will have positive 2 nanocloomb. And in the inner surface of the conductor, we will have positive 5 nanocloomb. OK, this is the solution. Do you have any question related to this example? Then let me continue with the Faraday's ice pail experiment. By using the Clomb's law, we can calculate the electric field inside the material and outside the material, okay, for different shapes. And by using the Gauss law, again, we can calculate the electric field within a conductor or outside of the conductor or far from the conductor far from the spherical shape, cylindrical shape, or infinite metal sheet, okay? So you can calculate electric fields by using Clombs and Gauss law. And we have learned that the electric field within a conductor is zero because there is no charge within the conductor, okay? We have given this information. If this is a solid conductor and if it has certain QC charge, then all charges are located on the surface of the conductor and inside electric field is zero. OK, we have seen this one. Faraday corrected this idea, Gauss law, by using ice pail experiment. OK. So this experiment corrected the calculations and results of Gauss, then also the results of Clomb's law. 
So this is the experiment. So now let me explain what is this experiment. We have a container, this one. This is the lid of the container, this one. Made from metal, metal container, and this is the metal lid. Okay, and here we have an insulating stand. Okay, so there is no electrical connection between this metal container and ground because here we have an insulating stand. And then here we have a charge conducting ball, positively charge conducting ball, and it is hanged by an insulating thread. Okay. These are the materials used in this Faraday's ice pail experiment. Then now, what will happen if we open this lid and put this charge conducting ball into the container? So if we put this charge metal ball into the container, you see there is no direct contact to the container. I just hold this metal ball here somewhere in the center within the container. Then since this metal ball is positively charged, it attracts negative charges here, you see. It attracts negative charges and repels the positive charges. You can consider like this. Lit is also metal and negative charges also collected in this inner side of the container and positive charges are located in the outer surface of the container, on the outer surface of the container, okay? Then, under this condition, I just put this metal ball into the container, okay? Then I have direct contact between metal ball and container. So what will happen? So if I put this positively charged metal ball here, then we have contact. All negative charges will be cancelled due to this positive charge. Okay, same amount of positive charge. Then we will have this condition. The ball loses its charge and it is compensated with the negative charges on the inner wall of the container. And then what about the final result? We have only positive charges on the outer walls of the container, okay? It is metal and we know that in metals, even if you have a hollow, all positive charges are collected on the surface of the material and the net charge inside the metal, inside the conductor is zero. So what do you see here that there is no charge inside this metal container, even this metal ball is also neutral because now it is also part of the metal container. Now we have this type of metal container you can consider, okay? This is the inner surface of the metal container. This is the outer surface of the metal container. And if you take this metal ball out, then you will find that it has indeed lost its charge. So if you take the metal ball out, then Q will be zero, okay? So this is the experimental evidence for the Gauss law and also the Clomb's law that the charges in conductors are distributed on their outer surfaces and inside of the conductor, there is no net charge, there is no electric field, okay? This is the experimental evidence for the Gauss law. Do you have any question here? Let me continue with the van der Graaff generator. It is very easy to understand. Just stay on the line. The 
principle is more is same as in Faraday's ice pail experiment. So here we have a conducting shell, okay? And I would like to charge this conducting shell with positive charges, okay? How to make it positively charged? In order to make it positively charged, I have to take negative charges from this conducting shell, okay? From this metal shell. So here I am using an insulating belt and here there is a motor and this motor is rotating this belt like this. And here there is also a rotor, let's say, and this is rotating like this. So then I am taking negative charges from this metal ball. Negative charges are moving like this. Let me clean this part and then you can better see it. Here I have negative charges and when I move this belt, these negative charges are taken from this conducting shell and they are moving to the belt. And you see here I have negative charges taken from the conducting shell. Okay. And here we have an electron sink. What is electron sink? You can check from internet. Okay. This is not ground. Electron sink is a special material collects the electrons okay then it takes all electrons from the belt then the belt becomes positively charged and these positive charges are tra transferred to the conducting shell then conducting shell becomes positively charged okay this is the working principle of van der Graaff generator and now Let's discuss electrostatic shielding. It is also related to the Faraday's ice pail experiment. Here we have a conducting box. It is immersed in a uniform field. Let's consider at the beginning, this conducting box has no charge. Q is zero. Actually, this conducting box like this, I'm looking from the cross section. It looks like this. Conducting box. If you look from the cross section, you see like this. And at the beginning, this conducting box has no charge and we have uniform electric field. OK, so if you use, for example, here, positively and negatively charged plates, you can produce uniform electric field and just take this connecting box and put this one into this uniform field. Okay, now we will investigate this situation. During the last chapter, we have seen how to produce uniform electric field. By using charged plates, you can produce uniform electric fields. Let's consider this is positively charged. This is negatively charged. And then we have electric field from positive side to the negative side. OK, so within the conductor, we have free electrons. OK, and this free electrons are attracted by this positive side of the plate, let's say. And here we have positive charges attracted by this negative plate, okay? Then we have this type of distribution. The field lines behaves like this. At the beginning, if there is no metal container, let me draw it here. This is the positive plate. This is the negative plate. And just consider that we have uniform electric field lines. But whenever I put this conducting box into the electric field, then electric field lines will be manipulated like this due to the collection of the charges on both sides of the conductor, okay? Then what about the electric field? Within the conductor, you cannot see any electric field. Electric field is zero, okay? 
field pushes electrons toward left side, net positive charge remains on the right side, okay, then the field of the induced charges, induced charges are this one. At the beginning it was neutral and now we have induced charges on both sides on the box combines with the uniform field to give zero total field inside the box. Okay, then within the box we have no electric field. So this property of the conductors are very useful and used in the industry widely. Now I will show you here one example electrostatic shielding. So here we have a high voltage source. Okay. Here we have high voltage source. Just consider it is positively charged. Okay. And then here we have a guy and outside of the guy there is a metal shielding. Okay. There is a metal and we have learned that within the metals, within the conductors, electric field is zero. Electric field cannot enter into the met metals, into the conductors, okay? So since here we use a metal shielding, electric field cannot enter inside, the electric field is zero, and this guy can survive, okay? So little to no electric field can penetrate inside the box because we surround the object, the guy, with a conducting box. This conducting box is called as Faraday cage in Turkish Faraday Kafesi, very famous in applications in industry. So now I have three transparencies and then I will finish this part of my lecture field at the surface of a conductor. Actually, we have investigated this one, okay? Here we have a surface. This is the charge conductor and this is the outer surface of the charge conductor. And we would like to calculate the electric field at the surface of the conductor. And I have already told you that the electric field is always perpendicular to the surface, okay? If you have spherical surface, electric field is perpendicular for any part of the small segment of the area, okay? If you have this one, a metal sheet, then electric field is again perpendicular to the surface, okay? So don't forget this one. The magnitude of the electric field just outside a charge conductor is proportional to the surface charge density. We have already done this one. Then let me give the result here. And don't forget this one. I am dealing with this area, okay, in calculations. This is the area A. And here we have electric field lines perpendicular to the surface. And here we have electric field and this other side of the cylinder, we don't have any electric field because the field lines are perpendicular to the surface. We are only dealing with this one. So again here in this side, electric field is zero and here we have electric field lines. So the electric field at surface of a conductor is given with this expression, sigma over epsilon zero. In this example, we have done it actually. Where is it? Let me show you somewhere here. Yes, we have we have done it here in this example, example 22.7. Okay, you can look at this example. So now let me continue with the application. Actually, this is happening in the nature. Why lightning bolts are vertical? So you see like this, okay? They are more is vertical from the atmosphere to the Earth, okay? Our planet is a good conductor and its surface 
has a negative charge. So just consider this is the Earth. And it is conductor and it has negative charges on the surface of the Earth. OK, hence the electric field in the atmosphere above the surface points generally downward toward the negative charge and perpendicular to the surface. So around the Earth, we have atmosphere and we have positive charges in the atmosphere. OK, so then you can see the direction of the electric field. OK, then you can understand the direction of the lightning balls. The negative charge is balanced by positive charges in the atmosphere in a lightning storm the vertical electric field becomes great enough to cause charges to flow vertically through the air. Then the air is excited and ionized by the passage of charge through it, producing a visible lightning bolt. So there are many molecules and ions okay, in the air. So due to this electric field, they are excited and ionized and then we see these lightning bolts perpendicular to the Earth's surface, okay? So they are like this or like this, you can see it. Do you have any question here? And this is the last example of this lecture. Example 22.13, electric field of the Earth. The Earth, a conductor, has a net electric charge. The resulting electric field near the surface has an average value of about 150 Newton per clomb. We are talking about this one. Just consider that Earth has a perfect spherical shape. Just consider like this and it is negatively charged. OK. And then what about the electric field at the surface? You can calculate this one. OK, if you know the area of the Earth, and if you know the total charge enclosed within the Earth, then you can calculate the electric field here on the surface of the Earth. And this electric field is given with 100 Newton per clomb directed toward the center of the Earth. OK, so in this direction. Because Earth is negatively charged. Then question A, what is the corresponding surface charge density? What was surface charge density? This sigma. Sigma is given with Q enclosed over area. OK, sigma is S. Then in B, what is the total surface charge of the Earth? Total surface charge Q is asked. OK. Then how to calculate sigma in this formula? If you know the electric field, you can calculate the surface charge density because here we have electric constant. Just use this formula. Electric field on the surface of a conductor is given with sigma over epsilon zero. This is very useful formula. Don't forget this one. And then I can use this formula here to calculate the surface charge density Ask in question A. OK, what is the corresponding surface charge density? Surface charge density can be calculated with this relation. Then this is constant 8.95 times 10 to minus 11 clomb square per Newton per meter square. And this is given here. I am writing minus 100 Newton per clomb. Why? Because Earth's surface is negatively charged. OK, then here I have negative one. Actually, it is showing the direction of the electric field on the surface of the Earth. It is inward. OK, this negative sign is showing us inward direction. Then finally, surface charge density is negative 1.32 Newton clomb per meter square on the Earth, OK? Then what about the second question? 
what is the total surface charge of the Earth? So what is the Q? So how to calculate Q? We can calculate Q with this expression. Sigma surface charge density is given with Q over area and I need Q. Sigma surface charge density is already calculated here in the part A. And if I calculate the area of the Earth, then I can calculate total charge on the surface of the Earth. Then this is the 4 pi r square area of the Earth. And then this is the radius of the Earth. If you consider perfect spherical shape, actually it is not like this, but just for simplicity you can do that. And then just put the sigma here. This is the sigma surface charge density we have already calculated. Then finally, total charge of the Earth is given with this one, total surface charge, minus 680 kilo -clomb. okay? So this is the answer of the question. Do you have any question related to this example? Then with this one, I finish this chapter. Next week, we will continue with electric potential. See you next week. Bye-bye.